Hi everyone, my name is Adam from Pactimo. We are here with Ronan McLaughlin, a former professional Irish cyclist who on June 30th dethroned the previous Everesting champion Alberto Contador by a whopping 23 minutes. Um, he retired more than 15 years ago from the professional scene in 2013, um, but now he wears multiple hats from coaching to supporting a UK cycling organization, Sustrans, that encourages children to walk and cycle to and from school. He also serves as the executive director for on the board of Cycling Ireland. And last but not least, uh, he is a custom representative for us here at Pactimo. So I'm very, very excited to talk with him about his Everesting ride. This was his second attempt on Mammore Gap, which he had to scale more than 80 times for a total of 7 hours and 18 minutes. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with Everesting, it involves climbing a total of 8,848 meters, the equivalent of 29,029 uh, feet in elevation in a single push, which is the equivalent elevation of Mount Everest. So with that, I wanted to say a big thank you and congratulations to Ronan. Um, I'm very excited to talk with you and share your story with our community. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Adam, for having me on the on the show. It's uh, it's great to be here and uh, great to be uh, talking all, all things Pactimo, I suppose. Because as you said, I'm <laughs> I'm uh, quite quite biased towards Pactimo, so I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. really, really really looking forward to it. And one th I'll just uh, one thing we left out there was uh, sure. I'm chairperson of Foyle Cycling Club as well, who are uh, my local my local club. So can't can't for, can't forget the club boy. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for letting us know. Uh, I wanted to just start things off by hearing a little bit more about what you did this challenge for, the charitable search and rescue organization uh, called Community Rescue Service, and why you chose that organization in particular to support. Uh, yeah, the Community Rescue Service are, are based in Northern Ireland, and they're uh, you know a volunteer organization who um, basically search for missing people or people in difficulty and uh, unfortunately my wife's uncle uh, went missing about four years ago and um, the community rescue service were just incredible in the work that they done and um, although they do fantastic work and you know there's never nothing's ever too much of a problem for them they'll do anything that they can to try and help find a missing person and um, mm. they're it's, it's still not a group that you want to have to uh, work with because it you know ultimately it means that someone close to you has, has gone missing. But but when but when they when you do need them they are they are fantastic. So since then I've I've wanted to do something for the charity and um, wanted to raise money for them somehow and had a couple of ideas down through the years that that for different reasons I wasn't able to uh, materialize. But uh, when I was going to do the Everson this year it seemed like a, you know, it seemed like a, the right thing to do was to try and raise some money in the process for for this sort of worthy cause. That's super great, and it looks like from this morning I was looking at the fundraiser that you're at just about five thousand eight hundred pounds. So only yeah. only three thousand pounds left to go. So we'll make sure to include that link uh, just in wherever you find this video, so that folks. I'm assuming that you're going to keep this open until hopefully you reach the goal. Is that right? Yeah, well, if we got three thousand people to donate a pound each, then <laughs> we would pretty much be there. So uh, that'd be great. <laughs> that would be great, but then it'd be, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be uh, a, a huge, a huge. Uh, put it like this: two, two, three weeks ago, when I started this, mm -hmm. I, I thought it was a bit of a wild dream to even consider getting the eight thousand eight hundred and forty-eight pound. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's a very realistic possibility now. So. Uh, uh, both myself and and obviously even more so the charity are very very uh, appreciative of of every penny that's been been donated. So thank you to everybody that has. That's great. Well, yeah, we'll make sure to include the link. So if anybody does want to throw some cash for Ronan's awesome cause, please do. <laughs> but yeah, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, I know that uh, this was your second attempt, right? And the very first time you did it, you did have two sections that seemed to be way flatter and I think that was so that you had more time to essentially recover and it sounds like you cut those two out um, obviously that makes it way more strenuous and less more less time to recover uh, what was your kind of reasoning and thought process behind that yeah good good question and exactly as you said I had those two 
they're by no means flat, but they're they're much flatter sections, both mm -hmm. more so at the bottom and then a short section at the top. That for the first ever thing that was, although I realised that I could climb quicker by using the steeper segment, I was very concerned about the fact that I was going to have to do so many ascents of this uh, this steep climb and. You know the the average gradient that's been reported for the climb at 11 percent for the first segment and 14 percent for the second segment <laughs> sort of hides hides the fact that at its steepest near the top it's 24 percent and there's a there's a good long section in the middle at a, an average of 17 percent so oh, um, <laughs> yeah so I, I genuinely I genuinely didn't know starting it was it even possible to cycle up my more gap that many times <laughs> um, so just for that very reason. Even though I completely recognised that it would uh, result in me doing a longer, a longer uh, time, I still kept in those those parts just to give me the chance to recover and and allow myself to complete the challenge first and foremost. And right. um, once I'd done it the first time and had a really good time, and the f the first the first ever thing was you know the fifth best time ever, mm -hmm. um, that and it was an Irish record, so that sort of allowed me. The confidence, um, and it gave me the sort of mindset that I have, I have achieved this already. I can throw caution to the wind, and you know, do everything I can to go as fast as I can in the second Everest thing, and I have nothing to lose. You know, I have, I have the Irish record. I have a good time. So, <laughs> uh, and and I had the experience of knowing that you can actually climb up this road so many times. So, mm. and that just allowed me to go for the steeper segment on the on the second on the second attempt. So you had already planned to do that the entirety of the time. You weren't like halfway through it and then decided, oh, well, maybe I should just stick to that. So it was kind of the plan going in, right? Yeah, we had sort of everything planned to the nth degree, as the saying goes. And um, <laughs> yeah, they, they, that, that was the plan all along. And, um, and you know, one, one of the really good things about Everesting is that um, with most other sporting events, plans tend to go out the window pretty quickly because they're affected by you know competitors plans or rivals plans and how, how their uh how their race affects affects your own personally but so the good thing about everything is that it's just you and the mountain so and um, <laughs> you can pretty you can pretty much stick to plan pretty well if, if you've got a you know a fairly uh uh realistic and and well thought out plan and, and before you go into it well, so yeah, I wanted to talk about that because it did sound like even the day of that you had planned to do it, plans did kind of go a little bit awry because of weather, that it rained so much. So, and that you started in the rain too. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that and how you managed to to still attempt it without, I guess, trying to postpone it and how you managed to deal with, with some rain, I guess, what, as the start. Well, I suppose being Irish, you you kind of get well used to the rain, um, and and uh, luckily skin is waterproof, so uh, I just sort of uh, had to That's decide to get point. on with it. But no, all, all joking aside, I I had been you know concentrating quite a bit on the on the weather forecast and hmm. looking at the long range forecast and trying to plan which day would be good for the Everesting. Um, especially for the second attempt because I knew I was trying to do the best time that I could so I wasn't going to go for a day that um, you know wouldn't have been optimal so I was looking for first of all I didn't want a headwind I wanted a tailwind obviously for, right. for obvious reasons I, I wanted uh, a day that would be warm but with a bit of cloud cover so that I wasn't baking in the sunshine mm. uh, and ultimately or uh, sorry uh, I would prefer for it to be a dry day, but uh, when I was looking at the long range forecast, the the thirtieth of July when I ended up doing the second Everesting looked like it was going to be from from about one p.m. onwards was going to be the perfect day for Everesting. Uh, it had pretty much ticked all the boxes that I was looking for in terms of weather forecast, and hmm. um, but only from one p.m. onwards because wow. the morning time was going to be really cold and really wet, so I c I couldn't couldn't do it in the morning that you, like you would normally start this i think if you look at the vast majority of other times on the everesting hall of fame they all start very very early in the morning and oh, mine's is actually in in the afternoon <laughs> uh, the complete opposite um, and i finished you know because of that i ended up finishing really late at night i think 10 p.m it was pretty much pitch dark when i finished yeah. um but that was just you know waiting for when the forecast said it was going to dry up which should have been one o'clock but Hmm. When I got to the climb just before one o'clock, it was still really raining quite heavily. 
Uh, we couldn't even see the top of the climb from the bottom. Uh, <laughs> so we decided to start. <laughs> it wasn't looking too good. Um, but we, we, we kept the faith in the forecast. And That's cool. I had, I had pretty much every weather forecast app on my phone. They were all saying it would dry up. So we got to about huh. two two thirty, and it still hadn't dried. And I just sort of said, well, I have it. I put it on Instagram that I'm doing it today. So I've kind of come back to it. Um, <laughs> And the forecast is it will dry up, and you know even if it doesn't, I'm here now. I may as well start, take my chances, and worst case scenario, you know we might get some more donations for the charity. So I just right. got on the bike and and got on with it, and it it worked out all right in the end up. That's amazing. By by the end of it, I'm just wondering, did you end up having like bike lights ready to go, or was it more like your team was able to like? I don't know, because it's it, it only takes you about, was it, I read this, that it was about five minutes to go each round, more or less, is that correct? So what yeah. what was that distance between it you know, was, start to finish? Uh, it was about, um, I'm taking a bit of a mind blank now, but mm -hmm. if I remember right, it was about four minutes and 40 seconds okay. uphill, about 40 seconds downhill, right. uh, and all together it was about 1.6 kilometers, I think. Okay, um, so that's not super so was, far. So you could, would, what did you have groups on both sides that you could then have some light support you, or did you try to bring lights with you? What, what was that idea or strategy? Uh, it was only really the last lap or two that the, the, it gets dark here pretty quickly. Okay. Um, but we we didn't have lights with us, and I suppose that was an extra bit of motivation to get finished pretty quick before <laughs> it got dark. <laughs> yeah, that's so, so funny. You know, bear, bearing in mind that the the planned start time was an hour and a half earlier than the time I actually got right. starting. Uh, it, it getting dark w wasn't really something that we had considered or prepared too much for. Um, most of like given given the nature of the climb as well, it's it's almost perfectly straight, mm -hmm. um, quite short, so you can see from the bottom to the top quite easily, mm -hmm. uh, and th there were so much supporters and, and people there to cheer me on that <laughs> it, was never, it was never really too much of an issue that I didn't have lights on my bike. Obviously, even when I go out training during the day, I even have lights on my, my bike, but I didn't, I didn't want to be carrying big heavy lights up and down. <laughs> no, I know, yeah. So that's something maybe we should talk about because I've been reading a ton about this bike setup of yours. It sounds like you're pretty, pretty particular about this, which makes sense. To do something like this, you have to be pretty, pretty well thought out and planned. But it sounds like from the first attempt, I believe it was you had your bike was seven point four kilograms, so sixteen point three pounds, and you got it down to six point two kilograms, so about fourteen pounds. Um, how did you end up modifying your bike, like from swapping out? I, I read about you changing out the rims and tires. You set different psi pressure on the front versus the back. Um, I saw photos of you having having cut off the lower half of their the handlebars, handlebars, which I, I've been told is not something that's very uncommon. So what else, what all did you do? I guess maybe walk us through that. And is there anything else that you would have done differently? Um, yeah, so I suppose I'll start with what I did do. And that was, uh, as I said earlier, I, I threw caution to the wind. Uh, the first time around, I didn't want to change too much about my bike because mm -hmm. I was afraid it would result in some discomfort that might result in me not finishing the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but for the second time, that didn't really matter anymore. So I, first of all, changed the handlebars to a lighter set of handlebars. Um, but then sort of to make them lighter, but even more so to compensate for the fact that they weren't aero handlebars, I eventually cut the lower half of them off. Um, you know, the, the drops, if you think about them, are just a cylindrical shape sticking out in the wind, so they were going to be <laughs> very, very on aerodynamic. And, you know, I, I, was, I was descending at 55, 60 miles per hour. Wow. That, that, can, make, that, that can make a huge difference at, at that speed. And... Um, so yeah, I, I cut those off. I changed the, the wheels, this, a friend of mine, Philip Dagenham, met me the wheels. Um, I put on a nice set of tubular tires on there that sort of had very, very low rolling resistance, but also in combination with those rims were quite aerodynamic. Hmm. I The bike is normally 11 speed, but uh, or 11 by two or two by 11. Mm -hmm. And what I effectively turned it into was one gear at the front and three at the back. Oh, and cool. So <laughs> I, I, I sort of worked, worked out from the first ever thing that 
um, from the, from the electronic shifting data that I had, um, I had only used the 25, the 28, and the 32 sprockets. Oh wow! Um, so I just decided, you know, if I wasn't going to use the other um, eight, why why bother carrying them? So they had to go. Uh, <laughs> the front the, the front chain ring came off. The front the radar came off. And again, while while those two things are saving weight. Um, the sort of the the bigger consideration for me even was the aerodynamic gains that I was going to get from them on the descent, mm. uh, and you know the quicker you get down, the quicker you can turn and get back into your climbing. So that yeah. that was a big factor. Uh, and then lastly, removed the bottle cages and bottle cage bolts and bar tape and any other little bits and pieces that I could get off it. They all had to go. Dang, yeah, that's the other thing I was surprised to hear. It sounded like you only had your phone with you right that you were blasting some music through um what exactly were you listening to when you were writing um i just got asked that question earlier uh, really actually, and uh, <laughs> i took a bit of a mind blank but uh, i think i had uh, the best thing might be if i uh, pull up my phone here and, and yeah sure. through uh, some of the uh playlists so uh Is it I like i have the tiger or something or <laughs> i don't know what you guys uh, listen to in ireland but I, I don't think I, the Tiger was on there, <laughs> but uh, the 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 Chicago Bulls theme tune was definitely in there. Oh which is no the way! Same sort of yeah, cool. uh, just because I watched the Last Dance recently. Uh, everything <laughs> then from traditional Irish music to Led Zeppelin to Guns N' Roses and oh, cool. uh, Bruce Springsteen. So it was literally no just a, a mix match of it was literally just hit shuffle on all my songs so okay uh and ended up with fat boy slim and Foo fighters <laughs> and uh yeah it was uh it's not it's not a it's not a playlist that would be at the top of any charts on spotify but it, it worked on the day it's whatever you like i think that's the most important <laughs> so yeah and i had i had a little mic where you can click on the next tune so anytime something okay cool. okay yeah. like you weren't into you can just kind of flip through it <laughs> Kept it, kept it upbeat as much as possible. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's that's another thing I was surprised to read about was just that you weren't carrying any food or water. But I, I guess considering, you know, relatively how quickly you were going up and down, how was that kind of trade off happening between you and your team? Um, who was there to support you? Was it only up at the top where you had folks giving you food or water, whatever you needed at the time? How did you go about that? Yeah, so uh, I had an incredible team that were, were supporting me for both Everest things, and mm -hmm. uh, that had you know it, it had a, a few different points to it. But I suppose one of the key ones was yeah the nutrition uh, aspect of it and the hydration aspect of it. Um, and for the first Everest thing, it was uh, another foil cycling club member, Alan Harkins, who was at the top. With uh, basically the idea was that every time I got to the top, I would call out if I needed an energy drink or an electrolyte drink or plain water or, or an energy bar or uh, boiled potatoes or gels. We had a whole, it was like a, it was like a supermarket aisle, <laughs> so it was at the, at the top of the climb with the amount of options that we had. And That's no great. matter what I shouted, they were ready to grab it within a second and hand it to me. And I took a quick drink or, you know, stuffed it into my mouth and chewed it down or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> You know that uh, the fact I was getting up there every five minutes, and and that it probably meant that I would have ate far at and drank far more than had I had it on my bike or on my person, because mm. you know I, I, w I wouldn't have. Every time I got to them, they were ready to hand me something. So every five minutes, I was topping up, and wow. for the second time, Alan had to work, and Sean McFadden, another local, fairly well-known local cyclist, here was there to. Get, do do the exact same job every every bit as well as as Alan had done for the first attempt, um, but then at the bottom I wasn't planning to take food or or, or water or anything on board, um, but we had Andy Deary at the bottom who was sort of helping with every time I came down the descent he would take a picture of me so that <laughs> if my Garmin failed we had a picture of oh, every descent wow. with a timestamp. So literally every single descent, he had a picture of me coming down. Wow. Um, but then he also had a bottle and a gel there just in case. Um, I think one time I needed to get a bottle at the bottom. It was because I'd taken a gel on the way down and then my mouth was like dried out. Hmm. So he had a he had a bottle of water there that I could take and oh and great just, that you know it, it freshened me up for the for the climb again. So uh, yeah, and then we had my mom and dad were there as well and. 
Um, uh, I know a few people. Caroline Kelly was there for a good bit of it, and I, I don't want to start forgetting people now. So yeah, there was, huge, sure. there was a huge amount of support there. Right, um, but yeah, like my, my mum arrived with uh, boiled boiled potatoes and espressos, and That's there's, so a, there's great. a coffee shop <laughs> and and then an old castle or an old, an old fort nearby. So she had gone there and got an espresso, and yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I, no matter what I asked for, it seemed that they were able to find it, so it went quite well. <laughs> They're like, just wait one second, we'll be right back. <laughs> That's so great, yeah. I guess another thing that you had brought up that just made me think about it, um, for those that are less familiar with how um, you get it documented properly through the like association, or it's, it's a group, that I can't remember the name, but how exactly do you have to go about monitoring your attempt in order to have it be like verified so that it's like, official yeah so it's a group called the hells 500 who sort of uh they uh they're sort of the the keepers of the everesting concept or the uh officiators of the everesting concept i'm not sure what uh, what way to describe it but they they look after the whole process and they have a website everesting.cc mm -hmm. uh, and anybody can go onto that website you pick a strava segment that you're planning to use for the everesting uh, you copy the, the link for that Strava segment into their calculator on their website and it tells you you need to do X amount of laps. Oh, cool. Uh, and then you can actually work out, you know, based on your weight and your speed and your power and that's how long it's going to take you and, and the, those huh. sorts of things. Um, so I used their website um, after I did the first attempt. Uh, you can go on to another part of their website where you just submit your, your, your Strava file Mm -hmm. um, and then they came back a, a day later and ratified that I'd done the fifth best time in the, in the world at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the second Everesting attempt, um, basically what ended up happening was I think I did an Instagram story or something when I was driving home from the ride when I realized I'd done pretty pretty well. And, <laughs> um, they uh, they they must because it was Australian time. You know, it was it was nearly midnight with us, but it was during their working day. So oh, wow. uh, they they picked up the Instagram tag or mention or whatever it was, uh, and messaged me back straight away saying, you know, has this really happened? Are, are you yeah. are you serious? Blah blah blah. <laughs> uh, because because then it was the world record. Yeah, much of course. More, much more detail had to go into the second ride, so I had okay. to provide them with the Strava file. The power file for it. Uh, I also had all the photos. Should we need them? Which is um, good. We had Andy at the bottom, and some of Sean McFadden's family at the top were keeping uh, a note of every time. You know, each time that I completed each lap, both at the bottom and the top. So we had all this information that you know should it be required, we could we could send through. And and uh, I think then with it being a world record as well, that uh, the Hell's Five Hundred group. Uh, sort of call in a few more experts, so to, so to say, that uh, analyze, analyze the file, you know, a couple of extra sets of eyes to go through it just to make sure that everything is as it should be. And huh. um, it, was a, it was a pretty sleepless night for me, you know, <laughs> the, ex the excitement and the adrenaline and yeah. uh, the effort and all, and then waiting for my ride to be confirmed by the Hells 500. So um they i think i was still awake at four in the morning or something and eventually uh <laughs> and they from the hills 500 came back and says yeah you've actually gone even faster than you thought you had gone <laughs> that's so seven cool. hours and four minutes so wow yeah, but, no way <laughs> at, at that at that point there was no chance that i was going to get any sleep that night so <laughs> yeah. we just pretty much stayed up all night yeah because i remember messaging you and i remember you saying like your phone has just been blowing up like crazy so i mean i could imagine after that it just kind of got really insane kind of emails and calls from everywhere so <laughs> it's been it's been amazing and you know i really um i, I suppose i so i sort of knew from all my calculations before the second one that it was possible to break the world record oh cool um, but but because it was Alberto Contador um, and everything that he's done and the legend that he is of the sport I think I, I couldn't believe it myself and, and as such both before and after the second Everesting I've, I've said everything from I was planning to break the world record to I had no plan to break the world record because yeah. I just couldn't believe. Yeah. You know, it wasn't that my mind changed. It was just that I couldn't believe I was going to take Alberto Contador's record. And, and um, You know, I, th I think as well, given the fact that it is Contador who now sits and who, who had the record before before me, mm -hmm. means that it's got much more attention globally. 
um, yeah. which which I you know never never anticipated happening, and um, you know even 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 beforehand, I think I had you know text one or two people who were helping me out with the event. You know, Philip who lent me the wheels, and Alan who helped me with so much of the planning, saying, mm. "Yeah, we can we can beat Contador's time." But <laughs> I, I, I I always I always said to them. And those messages don't laugh, but yeah. I think I can beat Condor's time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's from so that great. point of view, I was I, I don't I don't <laughs> even think I believed it myself and that not not really believing it would happen meant that I had no anticipation for the amount of attention and coverage that it was about to get. Of and, course, yeah. Uh, although although it's been fantastic and uh, you know, I never thought I would have a world record, so I'm happy to talk about it as much as anybody wants. Uh, it, it, it did get a bit daunting at, at some points when there was just, especially that first day yeah. when there was so many phone calls and so many emails and so many texts, and you don't want to miss any of them or not get back to someone or whatever. Like it's, of course. it's important to reply to everybody. So, yeah, well, I mean, I'm very thankful that you're talking to us, but a, a big congratulations. I mean, it's a huge, huge accomplishment. I think um, one thing I also wanted to hear more about was Man More Gap specifically and, and why you chose that, that particular, uh, I guess, section of road. Um, is it like a place, I, I think I read somewhere that it was the first time you had tried riding up there, you had walked up per parts of it, especially that steeper section you were talking about earlier. Um, so the fact that, you know, you went from walking up this, like, hill, right, I don't even know how long ago that was. Maybe you can tell us that. To then doing it more than eighty times. I mean, that's a pretty huge, you know, accomplishment to, to go through. I think mentally as well for somebody or whoever might be listening, like people who don't necessarily think that they can do something, and then to flip it completely and say, I'm not just gonna do it, I'm gonna do it eighty plus times. So what what is it is there something special about that place that made you decide to do that? Um, I'm sure it's also strategic, but can you maybe talk us through why why Man More Gap? Sure thing, yeah. Um, so yeah, when I when I started cycling uh, 15 to 20 years ago at this stage, um, more well, probably about 17 or 18 years ago now, um, one of the challenges I set myself on the weekend was to cycle over to Man More Gap and just try to get up at once without <laughs> having to get off and walk. And it took me, I think it took months before I could actually cycle up it without having to get off and walk. You know, it wasn't wow. a case of, and, and there was there was so much that was quite similar to the Everest thing in that um, when I got to the bottom of it, I used to stop and take everything off my bike that I could remove there and then so the <laughs> bottles came off and the, the puncture repair kit came off and anything that was in my pockets got left at the side and yeah, I was just trying to make everything as light as I could to to get up. And this was just, you know, when I very first got a, a road bike. And so it's sort of, I suppose, it, it, it's it's no surprise now that I spent so much attention to detail <laughs> and getting the bike ready for this one. But uh -huh. um, with, with that in mind then, you know, um, uh, and, and, and eventually got up without having to walk, uh, which, you know, was a, a huge achievement for me at the time. Uh, and then... You know, Memoir Gap is fairly famous in, in Irish cycle racing history as well, and okay. you know the, the 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 Ross, which is sort of a, a tour of Ireland, and the actual tour of Ireland, um, they're they're two separate events, um, have both been up, uh, both been up Memoir Gap countless times in, in their history, and and the Ross is sort of the the most. Um, the most uh, well thought of, or the mo the most prestigious race in Ireland, let's say it that way, as the most prestigious race. It's it's been up there quite regularly, as regularly as three years ago. The Ross went up on more gap. Wow. Uh, it tends to tackle it from the other side, but everybody knows the climb for that reason. Everybody knows how steep it is. Hmm. Um, and then you know, just to come full circle for for me, it was just you know, it, it, when I decided I was going to do an Everest thing, I looked at loads of different climbs. Uh, there was pros and cons to all sorts of climbs. I initially was very much put off my more gap because I thought that's too steep to cycle that 80 times or whatever yeah. it might be. Um, <laughs> but the, the more I thought about it, you know, I, I, I definitely for the first attempt, all I wanted to do was break 10 hours. Um, and when I was doing it for charity as well, I thought, you know, to do it on my more gap, a climb that everybody knows so well, yeah. everybody will instantly recognize how much of a challenge it would be to cycle up that so many times. 
Uh, and then to come full circle, the fact that I started off by not even being able to cycle up at once to come back and doing everything <laughs> on it, uh, it, 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 it meant that, you know, once once I had processed all that in my mind, there was no other climb that I would do it on, really. It, it had to be my more gap, I suppose. And it, it is actually just absolutely perfect for everything as well in, in, in so many ways. So That's so cool. I or, mean, I think it's... it's... Perfect for everything fast let's say it, it might mm. not be the nicest kind to do it yeah it wasn't fast <laughs> well i mean I, I was reading that your output is really quite strong um and up towards the top that you know you're still you're still pedaling it's just obviously way steeper um but i'm sure that i guess over time you, you figured out how to essentially pace yourself just at the right amount of time that you wouldn't overexert yourself i, I suppose yes yeah. That, that that was very much part of the plan, you know. The mm -hmm. the steepest section is at the top, um, so the the plan was sort of you know push that a little bit harder to get over that steep section. Mm -hmm. um, you're immediately then into the descent where you can recover. But they also the great thing about it is that that super steep section that you've just hauled yourself over is immediately slingshot <laughs> slingshotting you back up to top speed. So yeah, um, it it works so well in 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 that way that. Not only is is the hardest part exactly where you're about to get your recovery, but it's also going to help you then to, to speed up again. So, um, yeah, it's 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 perfect. That's super cool. Well, there's a, a few other questions I was thinking about, mostly with um, I know you're probably more of like a gear person, just based on you know the technical aspects of of finishing this and doing it in such a record fast time. Um, but I know you wore this is kind of a shameless plug to Pac Timo, but you wore a flight suit. <laughs> Uh, I want to hear yeah. a bit more about, you know, I guess your your decision to choose on certain clothing. Um, and then I also read something about, you know, you wearing your helmet and you kind of had a bit of a strategy as well with like moving up and down properly, I guess, with like unzipping and then releasing the um, vents and then closing everything up on the way back down. I mean, is that is that something that you really find made a huge difference? I mean, obviously with aerodynamics and things like that, but... Um, maybe walk us through your decision, and I and I think also you didn't wear any like sunglasses or anything. Is that right? Uh, yeah. I didn't see any exactly. photos of you wearing them, so that's why I'm like, I was very surprised. I was like, aren't your eyes like bloodshot by the end of it? <laughs> the the only time I wore just to come to that first, I suppose, now we're on it. The only time I wore sunglasses was when it rained at the start. Okay. Um, but, and and I hadn't planned to wear sunglasses, but the problem was. When I was descending at 60 miles an hour in the rain, I, I genuinely couldn't see where I was going. So oh, uh, okay. the first time, the the first time that happens, I very quickly made the call to get some sunglasses on before the next descent. Yeah. Um. You know, just just so literally just so that I could see where I was going. Right. Um. The uh the rest of the time, I, I, when I was going so so hard on the climb and sweating and overheating that just find the glasses to be you know slightly annoying and they would fog up and stuff like that so uh one, once i didn't need them for the descent I, I just took them off for the rest of the rest of the day um but yeah the the flight suits i i'd i think everybody or not everybody but a lot of people will have heard uh an interview i did with uh Silka recently in their marginal gain show and you know we talked a lot about how sort of a lot of stuff that they had talked about in their podcast that I had implemented for my Everesting. Um but but one thing one thing that they had said was you definitely don't wear a skin suit for everything because <laughs> you want something comfortable. But the 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 uh supposed to get to my point is that to me the Ascent flight suit is it's yes, it's more of a wrist suit than a skin suit, but it's just so comfortable mm -hmm. and so much more aerodynamic than a jersey and shorts that it was never in question for me. I was always gonna wear the flight suit um, and and on both occasions it was absolutely perfect you know and mm. again I suppose there might have been a slight hesitation before the first one just because you know it is a climbing challenge and I was wearing a wrist suit mm -hmm. um, but you know it, it performed so well in the first one I was so comfortable that again it was never in question for the second one I was I was always going to wear the flight suit again and and then combined with the helmet which had the option to close it for the descent which really helped uh, with the aerodynamics and then open it for the ascent which uh, gave me the uh, breathability and just let me cool a bit more mm -hmm. you know it was it was uh, as as far as i'm concerned it was pretty much the optimal optimal setup there in terms of both comfort and aerodynamics well cool 
Um, and it's, it's also pretty lightweight, the, the, the flight suit, so there is no real... We, we do have the, the mesh jersey and shorts, which would be lighter, but right. um, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a huge compromise there in terms of that. I see. No, and I think for aerodynamics, it makes a lot of sense. I'm surprised that more people haven't you know thought about that as well, but they make a good point. I mean, if you're going to suffer for, you know, at the time, I guess, seven and a half hours or more, like... You might as well be very, very comfortable as you're doing it. So, it's it's a cool, bold statement that you made. It seems to have worked for you. So I'm sure many people are now going to start doing that as well. Well, let's let's just see how many people are ever staying on the more gap. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, I know that that I was reading about how you were training for for in general. I think you were just training right and throughout winter and things like that. Um, I don't know if it was specifically directed towards Everesting. Um, but I, I saw that you had read or written that your goals were mostly, and I'm not very into this technical side of things, so I probably won't be able to speak to it, but I want you to maybe just give us a bit of a background about this. But it, it's, it, I read that your goals were glycotic capacity and fat utilization. Is that something specific to Everesting that people should be aware of, or is that, was that just a specific goal you had for the season? Could you talk to us about that specifically? Uh, yes, and I suppose uh, a bit of both in that I think a lot of people nowadays know about FTP and, mm -hmm. and how important that is for, for cycling performance if you're training with power. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, although it is, you know, vitally important to have a good FTP, especially if you want to do a challenge that, like, like the Everesting, um, it, what 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 I sort of find is that sometimes it's sort of forgotten that FTP is only one part of the or one piece of the picture or one piece of the jigsaw and it's everything combined that's really important and um, what what I was sort of working on the glycolytic capacity is is uh, known well it's it's known as VLA max and the the challenge with that is that although you want your FTP and your your VO2 max to be as big as possible because that's basically your engine. Mm -hmm. um, you want the glycolytic aspect of your performance to be for for road racing. The challenge is always that it's as your your VLA max is as low as possible, but as high as necessary. Oh wow! Uh, because it's 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 kind of it's your ability to produce lactate, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so if you think about it, I suppose the easiest way to think about it is at one end of the scale, you've got um, a Grand Tour GC rider who is. You know, has very little glycolytic capacity. Can't really sprint that fast, but they can go for hours and hours and hours uphill. And at the other end of the scale, you've got a track sprinter who can do such a hard effort in one go that they can pretty much annihilate themselves for a couple of days in one sprint. Right. Uh, you, you tend to find that road racers be somewhere in the middle, um, and it's always a balancing act of to be able to road race well. You have to be able to do some of it, some bit of sprinting and some bit of climbing and some bit of time trialing you know, and, and combine it all together. Uh, so you're always trying to keep that nice, happy balance. But what, when I decided I was going to do an Everest thing this year, mm -hmm. I just focused completely on, on getting towards that uh, Grand Tour general classification rider end of the scale as much as possible. And that I didn't care if I could sprint or if I could attack or whatever. I just wanted to be able to ride at a really consistent pace for a really long time. And uh, so, yeah, that, that was sort of what the, the focus of, of the training was. And, it also happened to be training that I quite enjoyed, you know, with lots of uh, lots of uh, mid-range power and lots of low cadence, and just you know, if you do that on the flat, you tend to go pretty fast. So, yeah. Um, I, had, I had loads of fun training sessions, just going really, really fast, and <laughs> and just and just enjoying my bike, I suppose. That's great. That's a good. That's a good way to train. I feel like for most. Um, <laughs> I know it, it often gets lost. You know, a lot of people yeah. get too hooked up on training plans, and, and you know. Uh, again, trying to optimize everything to the nth degree, and some of the enjoyment then is lost, and it means it can't be sustainable. Whereas, you know, uh, training consistently and sustainably is tends tends to get the best results. So, I try to I try to keep fun as a as a big part of any training plan. Well, that's why we all bike, I think, for for sure. Um, I do want to leave time for for anybody that does have questions. So, if you guys do have questions, please do let us know. In the comments, I mean, everybody here is just saying, "You're such an inspiration. Way to go!" Uh, I am the cyclist. That was, I think, for one of the songs to be played. Oh yeah, um, just a good joke. But yeah, I think everybody's incredibly impressed. 
Um, one thing I, I wanted to talk about too before I see if anybody has questions here is um, as a coach and obviously as a person who now has broken you know the record by 23 minutes, um, did you have any thoughts about potentially becoming an Everesting specific coach? Is this something that maybe you're thinking about as more and more people reach out? I mean, I'm assuming it's going to be a thing just because it's such a huge accomplishment. Um, and as it becomes more and more popular, I mean, who knows? Is that something that you had in mind or is this maybe just something that might come of it? I don't know. Uh, it's uh, cer <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Uh, certainly not something that I had thought about in advance. Uh -huh. um, but I think it was... Uh, with Phil Gaiman that we were joking that, you know, maybe summer 2021, if, if we have all international travel back then, uh, Panache Coaching, my, my coaching company, might be running Everesting expeditions on the yeah. war gap. So yeah. I'd, I'd certainly be, you know, certainly more than happy to, to help anybody with an Everesting, even if they're aiming to, to top on my record. You know, what, mm -hmm. I, what I want to see is that this whole challenge is... Uh, you know, it, it has it has already become very uh, mainstream, I suppose, and it's become very well known this year because of everything that's happening. But um, I'm I'm sort of excited to see where it can go from here, and uh, certainly happy to help anyone. And I had uh, someone ring me last week who's planning to break the running <laughs> version of the world oh, record. Oh wow, cool! Um, so yeah, they were they were asking for some advice, and and likewise, whether. You know, if it's running or cycling or going fast or going at, at, at a more enjoyable speed, um, I'd be certainly happy to happy to help out anybody. Like so, um, yeah, get in touch anybody anybody who wants. Well, I'll make sure to include any links to to your coaching site or whatever else you you'd like to share. Um, Thank you. Maybe one last thing, I think, before we sign off, I want to be respectful of your time because I know it's late over there. Uh, what is overall I know that you know one thing I usually want to ask folks that we talk to is just since cycling is such a vast sport and there's so many different disciplines within cycling you have you know every end of racing to then people who treat it more like a lifestyle to a form of travel to whatever um, I'd love to hear from you just what do you what does the sport of cycling mean to you um yeah it, it, well it obviously means quite a bit to me um i've been cycling for well uh, you know i always cycled it when i was a kid where, where we grew up we had loads of uh quiet roads and and forest paths and stuff that, that you could ride on and then uh but as we were saying earlier just only 20 years ago i got into road cycling and uh then spent six years as a professional in, in europe and in mainland europe um, and since i came back i've, I've never stopped uh, racing, I still race domestically in Ireland um, mm -hmm. on, on the racing scene here, and really enjoy it. And I also commute by bike. And um, for me, it's just you know, I, I a lot of time I get asked, well, how do you how do you keep going for so many years? But it's just because I enjoy it so much. It's it's not you know even uh, you know I've been asked the question a couple of times since the Everest World Record. You know, uh, do you think will do you think will you? Uh, hang up the racing wheels now and <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've thought i've thought about it a couple of times and I, I can't find a reason you know to stop when when i still enjoy it if, if it was something that i didn't enjoy then then yeah that, that i would know then that the time's up but you know so long as there's a happy medium there and a good balance between uh you know family life and 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 racing then uh i'll, I'll keep going and I, I can always justify it by saying that you know, if I wasn't going to out training or going to a race or whatever, I'm, you know, I most likely would be doing something else. So um, it's uh, it's something that I know well, and it works quite well for me. And I think it's quite important as well, especially from you know the commuting point of view and and the uh, just the healthy lifestyle point of view as well. Is that so many of us now are you know either choosing to or forced to uh, commute by car. Um, and you know, we're uh, so many of us are leading less and less active lifestyles that, um, you know, I think that is vitally important as well. It's just for for your own personal health, but then also the the sort of the um, the equally important you know uh, climate climate change sort of crisis that we that we face at the moment. And 
um, for every time I get on my bike and, and cycle to wherever I'm going for work that day, it's it's one less car journey is the way I see it. So I think that's quite important too. An everyday adventure, yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I am getting a few more questions here, so maybe just before we sign off, uh, a lot of yeah. people here are asking, is there going to be another new record attempt that you're going to try to go for at all? Um, I, th I got asked recently, you know, if, if I lost the record, would I do it again? And uh, although I have, although I, I, I had no plans to do it again, I, I think, I think last week I, I got talked into doing it by accident. Um, but I, I genuinely had no plans to do it again. But it very much depends on, you know, if someone breaks a record, what is a new record? If if Egan Bernal or someone like that goes and does six and a half hours or six and a quarter hours, then by all means, that's me. I'm, I'm tapping out. I'm, I'm done. But you know, if, if, if Egan Bernal goes and beats me by one minute, or if someone who I've never heard of goes and beats me by one minute, then of course I'm going to be thinking, God, I, I want their, I want the record back. But, uh, so yeah, the the both the 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 great thing and the the horrible thing about Everest thing is that I won't know in advance that the record is about to go. I'll just wake up some morning and the record and will be gone. Out. And yeah, yeah, and and I suppose then it'll depend on what the new record time is, whether I I do it again or not. So, wow. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely did say last week that I would do it again. I, I made a bit of a deal with someone that I would do it again. <laughs> so uh, we'll have, we'll have to wait and see if I get held to that or not. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll stay tuned. I guess. Uh, yeah. Did even did Contador reach out to you or anything like that to say congrats or like? No, I haven't. I haven't I heard, heard from from, uh, okay. from Alberto Contador. No. <laughs> um, Someone by the name of Albert C did did donate to the the fundraiser, so oh, I'm not sure cool. if that's yeah, if that's maybe a he code, did code name or not. But, uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm sure uh, I'm sure Contador has has uh, he's, he's not too worried about about yeah. Ronald McLaughlin. Like, and, <laughs> um, I, I suppose I should say like if if someone was able to you know if someone was able to come on and say. Or ring me tomorrow and say, look, if if you do another everything, I can guarantee the fundraiser will get to eight thousand eight hundred and forty eight pounds, and that would be that would be a good enough reason for me to to go again. Then I definitely would do it again. So well, that's uh, that's super great to hear. So start donating, people, and we'll end up <laughs> getting another story out there. It would be super great. Well, um, I really appreciate your time, Ronan, and thank you so much for taking the time just to talk to our community. I'm sure that they. Everybody here seems to love it from what I'm seeing, and um, we wish you all the best. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely make sure everybody knows you know, where to donate, and if they want to reach out to you um, for coaching opportunities or anything like that, um, we'll be sure to have a link there as well. But thanks again so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. We'll see you. <laughs>